Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In this week's Lenten Reflection, we are thinking about what we count as the Seventh Commandment, where we're told, you shall not steal. And as we think about stealing and as we think about the passion of our Lord and the charges that were brought against him, keep in mind that stealing as regards taxes is only one way that the scriptures address such matters. You may recall that there were false charges against Jesus. There were unscrupulous spies coming from the elite establishment of the time saying that Jesus was a revolutionary who told the people that there was no need to pay taxes to the government and as such was dangerous. But Jesus in his trial turns everything upside down when he speaks those memorable words when people sought to bring charges against him. I first memorized it as, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but unto God the things that are God's. Or a mo more modern translation of those words might suggest, give to the government through taxes those things which are rightly to be given, but also remember one's obligations to God and to life itself. So Jesus did not steal, of course, but in many ways his mission was revolutionary. And when he says, give to God the things that are God's, it may bring even us up short because we come to see how often in our own lives either in our offerings or in our management of life, we are guilty sometimes of stealing from God, at least partially. In the culture in which we live, we're reminded often of the threat of stealing. I bet you in your household, just like mine, every few days you'll receive an advertisement from a home security company suggesting that we're not safe unless we install their product. And it's not just protection of property these days, but even protection of our own personhood and our own identity. We hear about challenges and that, are, that come our way because people are trying to steal our identity. And too many people who I know have had life upended by that kind of concern. And it takes, it seems, forever and a day to set things right. We also hear in our time from various political voices or economic voices of the struggle between the so-called haves and the so-called have-nots. And it seems like each of those communities is distrusting of, distrustful toward, and nervous about the existence of the other. And so there's no end of mutual accusation and mutual recrimination and concerns even in our time and given the present threats that we face, uh, concerns about that strife between the haves and the have-nots. But when things go wrong, stealing is a problem that comes from a sense that I have a right to that which belongs to you. And whether it is possessions or reputation or identity, whatever else. Stealing is taking advantage of others by unjust means. And the just judgment against us for such sin, large or small, the way we look at it, the just judgment of God would be more than we could possibly bear. In thinking of what could possibly be born in this Lenten season, we're remindful of what our Lord Jesus bore for us. For in the end, he is placed on a cross between two thieves, and he is himself crucified as a criminal. It's not that he committed a crime, but he suffered for us as one who did. And the death of Jesus is for the sins of the world, as the prophet said so long before, by his wounds we are healed. And the healing that God brings us through Christ's death
frees us and frees our hearts from judgment. And we trust that because of Jesus, we are no longer regarded by the Father as one who shall be rejected, but are reminded that Jesus identified with us. And instead of us being enemies of God, he turns us into, as the hymn writer has called it, children of the Heavenly Father, grounded deeply in God's love. You may remember from Luke's Gospel the parable of the prodigal son. In that account that Jesus offers us, he speaks about a son who essentially wishes his father dead because he wants his piece of the inheritance now. And in a point of fact, we can regard what he did as early theft of inheritance. Well, as you know, the story as it unfolds, it didn't turn out well for that son. Dissolute living and profligate spending was a problem for him. And he comes shyly home to the father. And in that amazing account, the father greets him on the path with outstretched arms, welcoming his son home. And his heart is soft toward him. But then we meet that elder brother whose attitude toward his brother was quite different. No, he said, he does not deserve mercy. I've been the good boy. I've been the good son who stayed home with you, father. But the father turns his mercy not just to the prodigal, but also to the elder son. It's not clear that he accepted such mercy, but in that account, we see the heart of God. We see God's regard for us. Because of Christ, we are called to be agents of love, reflective even of the Divine Father's heart to our neighbors. I've been struck in these days of the threat of coronavirus, how often we are beginning to hear stories of remarkable neighborliness, stories of care and compassion and regard for neighbors which would lift them up during a time which would beat them down. Yes, we have a chance to be neighborly. And instead of looking over our shoulder nervously about those who might wish to do us harm, we can approach life with eyes wide open with the question, where can we do good for the neighbor? Where can we help the neighbor not only preserve what is his or hers, but also enhance their lives? Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said this. He said, do not resist an evildoer, but give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. That does not come naturally to us. We grow suspicious when we think someone is begging from us. But in fact, we can learn more and more to become givers because we have received the divine gifts in Jesus Christ. Near the end of the Gospel of Matthew, there's a parable in the 25th chapter. That's kind of significant to me because the first time I ever preached publicly was at that pulpit here at Holy Cross some 41 years ago, and Matthew 25 was the text for that account. It's the account of the sheep and the goats and the great judgment. And how shall we regard those sheep and goats. The goats were the ones who probably spent their metaphorical life kind of butting away the sheep from the feeding trough, taking what was there as their own, taking it not wishing to share. But the sheep, on the other hand, have looked out for others, perhaps even the goats. And the sheep were the ones who were providing for their neighbor as the needs arose. 
Now the parable is not meant to be just moralism. It really is a parable of faith, that those who trust in Jesus Christ live and move like, as we often hear, little Christs, little Christs in the world, caring for so many people. They see neighbors, that is, all people, as important, little treasures in God's eyes, creatures and children of the true God who has given them to us, given them to us, to love. And this sharing of love, even at the cost of personal wounds to us, is the giving that Jesus spoke about, giving to God the things that are God's, as Jesus did for us. We get now, we get to live as his ambassadors, ambassadors of love for others. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.